Do the giant toddler dance. You can shoot the curl free and easy. Honey, way to play the harmonica with your ass. <laughs> oh my God. Bigfoot. Dear Great Pumpkin, everyone's cray cray. It's not an exaggeration to say that Mystery Science Theater 3000 had a seismic cultural impact. From a sleepy Minnesotan TV station would spring forth not just one of the greatest comedy shows ever created, but the birth of modern commentary media. I would argue its widespread success was not just on the strength of its writing, or the delivery of the comedians, but because it was, fundamentally, an idea whose time had come. Observe, for example, the KTMA season. Unscripted beyond notes written on the movie from a pre-taping viewing, episodes created within a 24-hour cycle. It's rough. Like, extremely rough. I'd reckon most Mystery Science Theater fans would be hard-pressed to name a favorite episode from the KTMA season. Personally, I'd recommend The Last Chase, which depicts the ultimate boomer nightmare of cars being made illegal and being forced to live in walkable communities. There are things you pretend you've gotten used to. No cars, going to work at a job you don't like, and living by the rules. The endless rules that they've made for us over these last two decades. Racing cars are vehicles that uh, can go at incredible speeds and uh, compete with each other. They're private vehicles. Yes, private vehicles. Underwritten by giant corporations. Easy, I was chosen. Point being, while it was rough, it was also very much ahead of its time. Observant viewers will immediately notice the vibe is not entirely unlike modern commentary Twitch streams. Of note, the person who coined the term Let's Play back in the day, and young Slavoj Zizek body double, Slow Beef, even cited Mystery Science Theater as an inspiration on numerous occasions in his works. So we started talking over it, kind of like a Mystery Science Theater thing for bad Let's Plays. Let's Plays and meta-commentary leading, of course, to the golden age of YouTube and streamer content we enjoy today. <laughs> Anyhow, the low-budget nature of the production was actually useful in getting the show picked up by Comedy Central, then named The Comedy Channel. The team were offered a mere $35,000 an episode, which, even after adjusting for inflation, doesn't seem like all that much considering what they likely spent on the noticeably increased production values. Put a pin in that scrappiness for later. Now, MST3K had a real solid run back in the 90s. Hosts changed, networks changed, but pretty much all the seasons had their golden episodes. There were a few duds, of course, but such is inevitable when riffing literally hundreds of bad movies. And! And! <laughs> Slightly before the turn of the millennium, the show ended with a laudable body of work to show for it. Growing up, I watched the show quite a bit, though being a kid, a sizable majority of the jokes went right over my head. Get! 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 There's a trade treaty here? I missed a great many obscure jokes, mystifying me in much the same way as my slow beef Zizek joke likely did for most of you watching this. It was still a real treat whenever it came on, an interesting way to learn about a variety of concepts and references through comedy, too. More than anything, though, I'm positive the show produced cherished childhood memories for many. Also, I can't speak for other formerly young fans, but I feel like being exposed to high levels of it at a young age may have given me some kind of a mental riff co-processor, constantly scanning conversations or situations for potential comedic angles. Anyway, a decade and change later, up sprang the Kickstarter, promising a new season. To say I was hyped would be an understatement. At that point, I was scrolling up the classic episodes via Club MST3K all the time, even listening to them at work as if they were podcasts. One summer, I even listened to the entire series in order, which was quite the journey. I was also a fan of the works of the MST3K successor states, of course, Rift Tracks being the big one. All said, I was looking forward to the return in a big way. Finding out that it would launch on Netflix caused me to finally bite the bullet and subscribe. So congrats, Netflix, you got at least one subscriber from taking on the series. As to season 11 itself, well, honestly, I'd be lying if I said my initial reaction was overly positive or overly negative. 
I must have somewhat enjoyed it at the time as I did watch all of it, some of the episodes multiple times even, but as time has gone on, I find my opinion souring on it further and further. Big shocker I realize with the video title and all. I couldn't quite place it, but something just felt off with it. Obviously, after watching the original series for nigh countless hours, there was going to be a shock in having different hosts, but I don't think it was just that. This was more than just nostalgia for the original. Something just wasn't working. Let me get this out of the way early. This video is the result of my attempt to explain why the Netflix seasons just didn't click for me. Emphasis on, for me. While I genuinely believe many of my issues with the Netflix run stem from objectively bad or rushed decisions, plenty of the stuff I take issue with will likely fall into preferences that I fully expect there to be a wide variety of differing opinions on. I would go so far as to say perhaps there exists a person who straight up prefers the Netflix seasons to the classic seasons. Though if I'm being honest, I'd be very, very surprised to hear about even any younger millennials or Gen Z people preferring the Netflix run to the classic seasons. But I get ahead of myself. Now other video essays of this kind might just read you a few news articles, pepper in some relevant observations, clips, gags, and call it a day. Here, however, having a genuine love of the material, I wanted a far closer look. So for this video, I did a statistical comparison between what I consider the greatest classic Mystery Science Theater episode, Space Mutiny, and the strongest Netflix Mystery Science Theater episode, Cry Wilderness. After all, what could better honor science comedy than comedy science? To be specific, in this comparison, I analyzed every single identifiable riff in both episodes for a variety of qualities. I am not joking. This was exactly as good an idea as it sounds. Apparently, I've simultaneously got the kind of neurodivergence that led me to believe this was a good idea, and also the kind of neurodivergence required to actually see it through. It's not an exaggeration to say that this took months. Not solid, mind you, I have a job and all, but still. You're welcome to review the collected and aggregated data yourself, linked below in the description of this video. It's not exactly first normal form, but it's not worst normal form either. You want to know the really funny part of all this, though? In terms of everything I was testing for, there was no appreciable difference between the populations of riffs. Was it that Netflix MST3K was fluffier and told less targeted jokes? Nope. If anything, Netflix MST3K may have even gone a little harder in some places, sometimes to its detriment. Was it that the classic episode's jokes were higher brow and required more specialized knowledge, leading to some greater enjoyment of getting them? Nope. The knowledge requirements for understanding the jokes in both follow about the same distribution, give or take a few percentage points. Was it that Netflix MST3K relied on significantly more pop culture references to the exclusion of other joke types? Nope. A whopping 1.78% more jokes for pop culture references. Basically, statistical noise. The major structural difference in the datasets was simply that the riffs were just significantly funnier in Space Mutiny. All of this is not to say the effort was fruitless, however. In fact, eliminating these factors strengthens the case for other potential causes. And in analyzing the data at this level, I uncovered some very interesting points of comparison leading to some alternate theories I'll get into later. Let me start going through the finer points of the analysis by introducing both movies. I'll begin with Space Mutiny. Admittedly, perhaps I should have selected Boggy Creek 2 to compare Bigfoot movie to Bigfoot movie, but it's hard not to go with Space Mutiny here. It is far and away the most enjoyed classic MST3K episode, insofar as the laugh counts on Club MST3K anyway. Kevin and Mike specifically call out Space Mutiny as doing a lot of the heavy lifting itself in its episode. Like Space Mutiny, 
is uh, it's just so silly on its own and the continuity is terrible and the acting is terrible and the, the hero is a slab beefcake or bolt rip rock or whatever you call him was, was so patently ridiculous that the movie itself did a lot of our work for us. But I think they're not giving themselves enough credits. There are a lot of banger riffs in there. <laughs> Open file on Litson. Space Mutiny follows an uprising on a colony ship named the Southern Sun. This flagrant breach of the law of the galaxy is valiantly squashed by Dave Ryder. Though you could be forgiven for forgetting his actual name. Fridge, large meats. Punt, speed chunk. Butch, deadlift. Trunk, slam chest. Fist, rock bone. Stump, beef knob. Smash, lamp jaw. Big, McLarge, huge. Ryder is accompanied by Leah Jensen, the daughter of the captain. Fun fact, the actors that played Dave and Leah married after meeting each other on the shoot, and they appear to be married to this day. Which, you know what? Good for them. That's like the ultimate bad movie meet-cute right there. Had the movie not led to the Mystery Science Theater episode, it still would have produced something of value at least. Somewhat off-topic, and I mention this mainly because I'm pretty sure I'll never have a better opportunity to discuss this, but believe it or not, a good version of Space Mutiny does actually exist. Sort of. Episodes The Oaf and Blood on the Scales of Battlestar Galactica are a better space mutiny than Space Mutiny ever had the chance to be. Admittedly, they're the culmination of whole seasons worth of writing where the stakes were massive, but it must be remarked there's a surprising number of parallels with Space Mutiny. Though not everything lines up, of course. War always brings out the worst in man. I don't know. I feel that I failed. I want you all to understand this. If you do this, there will be no forgiveness, no amnesty. So what's it gonna be, York? Admiral, don't do this. I'd be damned if I'm gonna let a guy like you run me off my own ship. You wanna shoot? Go on. Let's see if you got a pair. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Anyway, Space Mutiny's extremely goofy reputation is well deserved. The sets are clearly just some random steel mill, and they didn't care about continuity at all. And there's just an intense aura of cheese about the entire production. It's not hard to see why the host double dipped by doing it again in a Rift Tracks live show, complete with costumes. Now, Cry Wilderness, on the other hand, the episode I consider to be the best of the Netflix run, does not have anywhere near the reputation Space Mutiny does. In my estimation, though, when it was selected, they pretty clearly struck gold, and they knew it. I don't want to make predictions because I'll probably be wrong, but I, I kind of suspect that Cry Wilderness may wind up being a fan favorite because it was brutal. It was brutal to riff through. Cry Wilderness is a real oddity. If I had to categorize it, I suppose it would fall into the kid encounters alien or cryptid kind of genre, like E.T. or Santa Claus and the Ice Cream Bunny. But here, well, the defining features of the movie are, to name a few, an extremely unconvincing Bigfoot costume with no hands, an intensely bratty kid, more nature stock footage than some low-budget documentaries, endless uncomfortable laughing, a bizarrely violent resolution in an otherwise family-friendly movie. Now, while it may not be the highest-rated episode of the Netflix series on either the old Club MST3K nor IMDb, I find it the strongest episode because, for one thing, I actually remember a good many of the riffs, something I can't say for all the Netflix episodes. And of the riffs, there are a few real good shoots, so to speak. Oh, wow, you've got a lot of guns. What are all these names etched into them? Anyhow, now that you get the rough idea of the movies in question here, let's go ahead and get to some of the interesting data points in their respective MST3K episodes. I'd like to begin with a riff to riff comparison. I wasn't really expecting to find any overlapping riffs at all given the differences in the movies themselves, and the times in which the episodes were made, but the one pair I found were rather revealing as to some of the more subtle aspects of the craft. 
Take, for example, this riff in Space Mutiny. <laughs> if the first 10 minutes are any indication, this movie's gonna blow! Pretty solid, right? Now watch this similar one from Cry Wilderness. Man, if this is how the movie starts, I can't wait to see the rest of it. The differences are pretty striking for what are ostensibly very similar jokes. One thing you'll note is that in the Space Mutiny version, they build the riff with a line of dialogue from the movie as the foundation. Meanwhile, the Cry Wilderness riff is just kind of... there. This is not to say that Cry Wilderness doesn't have any riffs that build on dialogue. In fact, they use it to good effect in some areas. But right now, let's take the tiger. Lure the lemur and pants the panther! Okay, Ranger. But this overall lack of basis persists throughout the episode. Plenty of the riffs just didn't honestly have much to do with what was going on in the movie at all, or just otherwise felt like they didn't fit. I'd also like to call out the cadence of the deliveries. In the Space Mutiny riff, Tom Servo's voice actor, Kevin Murphy, gives a lively delivery that matches the energy of the scene. Jonah's is just, well... I mean, the last word is stretched sarcastically? But that lightly sarcastic delivery isn't really enough on its own to sustain the riff. Not trying to slam Jonah specifically here, he has plenty of solid deliveries later in the episode. If anything, I would say the fact that this riff was selected and attempted in the first place is the much larger systemic issue than anything related to its delivery. One of the most gratifying parts of watching MST3K is when the hosts tell a riff that touches on an area you have some passing knowledge or experience with. Hey, look in the back, it's the audience interest Ooh, curve. It's the thrill of getting an inside joke, a joke that feels like it was made just for you. Of course, the flip side of this is when you straight up do not get the joke, and it falls flat. Is a woman allowed to buy a man drink in your galaxy? Yeah, I guess it's okay. Kind of depends upon the man now, doesn't it? On what? I don't know. Whether or not he wants to accept it. Wow, it's like Nick and Nora Charles. I see. There used to be a way to watch a great many episodes on YouTube with annotations that explain just about each and every riff. Having gone through an in-depth analysis of just two episodes of MST3K, my heart goes out to the people, or God forbid, person, who put all those together only for that functionality to be unceremoniously removed from YouTube. To that end, I'd like to tell you about the most obscure jokes in each of the analyzed episodes. Space Mutinies is a fun one. Leah! McPherson! That's a really good strut suspension! I definitely didn't get this one until I looked it up for this project. Apparently, it relates to a type of strut used in certain models of classic cars. I can imagine a car enthusiast mechanic taking a look up from their work and giving a silent fist bump in recognition. Now, for Cry Wilderness, there's two obscure jokes I want to call out, for somewhat different reasons. First is this one. These guys may dress a bit weird, but I can assure you, these Megaforce dudes are badass. So this one I'm fairly confident slipped by most people who aren't bad movie heads. This is a reference to 1982's Megaforce, a movie with a lot of ridiculous acting and explosions. Oh, and that woman from War of the Lost World is in it. Now, I actually think the presence of this reference in Cry Wilderness is something of a mistake. While bad movies are sometimes referenced in riffs and host segments, Megaforce is way too obscure to warrant mentioning without context. The missing context that would make this joke work is if there was an actual Season 11 Megaforce episode. An absolute tragedy if they tried for it but weren't able to secure the rights, or it died elsewhere on the cutting room floor. It could have taken the season to new heights. While I do appreciate the reference, the fact that this wasn't removed after the episode didn't materialize does strike me as somewhat sloppy. Now for the other obscure riff in Cry Wilderness. No such creature as Bigfoot has ever been found. Hence the exhibit. I met him last summer. Where? Cabo. This is referencing a vacation destination, Cabo San Lucas in Baja, Mexico. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, new MST3K is uncomfortably bouge at times. Far from not too different from you or me, 
or a regular Joe they didn't like. You can really tell the voice of the show has moved from Minnesota to a noticeably more wealthy, coastal perspective at times. This isn't even the only joke in Cry Wilderness I would put into that category, either. I wish they'd let us leave during Bonnaroo. It's not like an overwhelming amount of booze, but for my money, it does detract from the experience when it comes out. Here's another fun angle to consider, comparing the running jokes in each episode. Running jokes can be seen as evidence of good planning and are something of a proxy for the overall cohesion of the riffs. When people think of Space Mutiny, they likely often think of the running jokes. Namely... Big, McLarge, huge. However, let's not forget some of the other exceptional running jokes in the episode. Oh! Oh, yeah, Mike, I uh, forgot to tell you that I had some moats put in because it's pretty hard to justify having this many railings without at least having some big heights to have railings in front of. <laughs> know what I mean? <laughs> it's not an exaggeration to say Space Mutiny is full of running jokes. These are the labels I went with in my analysis for them. Cry Wilderness, on the other hand, has significantly fewer running jokes. Although there are a few that can definitely produce a laugh or two. Hello, Jim. <laughs> I'm trying not to be terrified by you. <laughs> but admittedly, these are pretty few and far between. These are the running jokes I identified, though it's pretty charitable to even call some of these running jokes. Admittedly, the running jokes of Space Mutiny may have, in part at least, been due to the emergent properties of the movie lending itself to those kinds of jokes. But I still think it says something that there are far fewer in Cry Wilderness. I'd also briefly like to touch on this running joke in Cry Wilderness. Oh, uh, I'm gonna have to wing him to stop him. Won't be the first time. Bang! I mean, it's fairly dark, edgy and all to imagine the implications of this joke, but is it really all that funny? I had to add implied violence as a joke category when I started analyzing Cry Wilderness. Bang! It wasn't really a thing in Space Mutiny at all. I'm not saying violence can't be used for comedic ends, but incoherent violence as a comedy punchline seems like something best left in the bad old days of Control-Alt-Delete and Happy Tree Friends. Bang! The end. Roll credits. Let's talk about something lighter, the best riff in each episode. It's admittedly fairly difficult to choose favorites, but for Space Mutiny, I'm gonna have to go with the miraculous revival of Lieutenant Lamont. Hey, hey, she's Wait. dead! Wait a minute! <laughs> she died! Wow! Sir? I think it's very nice of you to give that dead woman another chance. Admittedly, this is something of a layup given the absurdity of the movie, but it's just the absolute incredulity of their delivery here that is perfection. Now, for Cry Wilderness, I would say it's this one. Nice puppet work on that throw pillow, Ryan. It's short, it's sweet, and it highlights an incredible lack of quality that might have otherwise gone unnoticed if not commented upon. I mean, just look at this thing. Seriously. In choosing these two, apparently my favorite riffs are those that cut deeply to the core issues of the movies in question. Not some obscure reference or complicated setup and payoff, but genuine engagement with the movie. Of course, not all riffs in either episode are as solid as these. Admittedly, my analysis didn't measure unfunniness in any detailed way. In general, I pretty much just marked the riffs I didn't enjoy as not funny and moved on. That said, I did measure the rare instances where a joke was either vaguely or explicitly offensive. There weren't a lot of these, blessfully. In Space Mutiny, there's a weird set of riffs on this one particular character. Whenever she comes on the screen, the hosts engage in weird vampiric hissing. <laughs> Contact the pilot of the Stingray Viper and ask if Professor Spooner is aboard. I'm insane! I'm honestly not sure what they're getting at here. Does she look like a particular famous vampire woman from media? This isn't the only episode where they do this kind of thing either. There's a character in the Escape 2000 episode they treat similarly. Wait. Nosferatu! Ah, kidnap their president! Again, I really don't get this, and I'm really hoping the comedic basis of this riff isn't what my least charitable interpretations imagine it might be. As to Cry Wilderness, a lot of the bad jokes are voiced in a really annoying, zany, YouTube-ish way, which I'll get more into later. 
I've got a rucksack full of sapphire oh. orbs in case we need to put one in the statue's eye socket, oh. you know, to open a secret door or something on account of this being like Indiana Jones and all. <laughs> But for the bad beyond that, there are some oddly offensive jokes throughout the episode. For example, this one. Ah, my PTSD! I don't know if this riff landed any better in 2017 when it came out, but I'm pretty sure childhood PTSD was still a known thing back then, too. Like, of all the things to joke about, do you really want to invoke childhood PTSD? The joke doesn't even come from anywhere or build on the concept, it just lazily throws it out there. I'm not trying to be some kind of killjoy scold here, and I realize this likely gets into the aforementioned area of personal preferences, but just... Nah. This one shouldn't have made the final cut. Speaking of stuff that shouldn't have made the final cut, there's a noticeable amount of what I'll call botched riffs in Cry Wilderness. Riffs that didn't work for either logical or technical reasons. Notably, there were no riffs that had these kinds of issues in Space Mutiny. To start, let's talk through this riff. Yes, economic uncertainties are making CDs a bad investment. I hear and obey. Now, if you know a bit about investing, this is kind of a non sequitur. If the objective is holding value in economically uncertain times, CDs, or certificates of deposit, would probably be a good investment, as their payouts are known in advance and generally not subject to turbulent market forces. Historically, I believe they've been out of favor compared to bonds, T-bills, and all, but who knows, maybe they'll make a comeback with interest rates increasing. Maybe the joke is actually that Bigfoot is psychically giving him bad investment advice? If you're out camping and a Sasquatch starts trying to sell you on an NFT drop, tell that crypto-hawking cryptid to take a hike. Mm-hmm. Anyway, another extremely underrated aspect of MST3K is timing. Not just in a traditional comedic delivery sense, but in weaving the riffs in with the movie audio, even selecting which movie lines can be mixed down and talked over, and which should be emphasized. The writers, editors, and voice actors must all navigate the gaps in the movie's dialogue. I never really considered just how difficult this constraint must be to work with until this analysis. This riff, where the end of the riff collides with the movie dialogue, highlighted it for me. You must leave for the mountains. I can't! They're sending me to school tonight, and Jim's out there waiting for me! Well, it's like they care about my well-being or something! There's another way out over there! Take it! It feels like a cut corner that this wasn't fixed either through mixing the movie down or by doing another, shorter take on the riff. Timing isn't only important in the audio, of course. Take this riff from early in the episode. Let's keep quiet. Let's keep quiet. Let's get around here. The first known smoker. Did you catch what the riff is about? I wouldn't blame you if you didn't. The subject is on the screen for, charitably, a second and a half or so. Even away from where your eye would be naturally drawn to in the scene, on the very edge of the frame. Were this on screen for longer, this would actually be a good riff, but as it stands, I don't think they should have gone for it. Alongside these kinds of tactical timing considerations, there's also the strategic placement of the host segments. These are seemingly used to break up and edit out less favorable parts of the movie. Side note, if you're watching this, you probably already know this, but a great many MST3K episodes heavily edit down the movies. Fairly massive chunks of Overdrawn at the Memory Bank and Mitchell were removed, for example. Anyway, point being, the placement of the host segment seems like it can have a pretty big impact on the surrounding jokes. Why do I mention this? Well... What's that noise? Whatever it is, I like it. It made everyone shut up. This riff doesn't work here at all. Nothing has been established yet after the break. Nobody was talking and then silenced. I can imagine this joke working if it was part of the scene prior to the break. But the host segment wiped the slate clean. The way it breaks up the flow makes me wonder if the jokes were written for the entire movie and then the host segments added in afterwards. Which, honestly, wouldn't be a huge issue structurally, but this particular riff definitely suffered as a result, and probably should have been edited to fit better. Puppetry. Wait, am I diegetically a puppet? Now, puppetry is a pretty minor concern relative to everything else, but generally speaking, the puppetry of Season 11 wasn't great? Maybe that sounds petty to say, and I'm pretty sure only a person who makes the incredibly poor decision I made in analyzing the episodes this way would notice, but
but there was considerably less presence and motion. This may come down to the fact that a lot of this is digital effects rather than traditional puppetry, at least in the theater. That's more a general comment though than a botched riff. This is the botched riff. Merry Bigfoot! He's just wearing a really crappy snowmobile suit. Bigfoot, I'm so glad I found you. Everyone else I know are jerks and human. Bigfoot, you can't stay here. Your stink is everywhere. Morgan knows about you. He'll kill you. What exactly is Crow doing here? There's no corresponding audio for this action of him moving across the theater. This feels more like an editing mistake than anything else. Despite the budget of season 11, this does make me think that there wasn't the same level of care taken as there was in some of the other seasons. I wouldn't necessarily attribute this to a lack of desire for quality on behalf of the crew, though, for reasons I'll get into later. While I didn't directly measure the verbal length of each riff, one of the more pervasive issues with Cry Wilderness, and more broadly the Netflix seasons, seems to be that the riffs are significantly wordier. There were numerous instances where you could remove a sentence in a multi-sentence riff, and it would have been considerably punchier. Oh, I couldn't eat another bite of this endangered rhino. It's so rich and delicious. Well, maybe I could have some more. It's so good. This, coupled with a slightly higher overall riff density than Space Mutiny, means that they're throwing a lot of words at you with not very much breathing room. This leads to a lot of rushed deliveries. Open can. Look, I've got hypoglycemia. And some of the overly verbose jokes just... no. <laughs> I don't need this. I could ride a bicycle, dammit, you hear me? Nah, who am I kidding? It's a movie. I'm gonna be in show business. Good night, folks! Bye, bear, out! I really hate to use this word, but a lot of the delivery is just so painfully soy, or slightly more charitably, annoyingly twee. Particularly in the way that the riffs can embarrassingly drag on, trying to prop up a weak joke with more and more verbal padding. Upon closer analysis, it wasn't quite as many of the lines as I had feared that were done in the dreaded zany YouTube voice, but it was a disappointing amount of them. On top of this, if I'm being honest, a great many of the impressions didn't really hit the mark either. This is actual footage of the actors attempting to escape the production of Cry Wilderness. I'm Vanna Hutzog in case you have one drink. Now on the Space Mutiny side, the impressions were a lot better, although admittedly it's not exactly breaking new ground to do a Santa Claus impression. You're getting a lump of coal. Side note, but my favorite MST3K impression might be this one from The Day the Earth Froze. Somebody please put me out, I seem to be on fire! An absolutely fire Bullwinkle impression there. Anyway, point being, in Cry Wilderness, I'm sorry but the delivery just isn't there. Moreover, their voices just aren't pleasing to my ear, honestly. On top of these vocal choices, there's another issue contributing here. There were a few riffs in the mix where the host deliveries belie the fact that they didn't really understand what the joke was. America, it seemed like a good idea at the time. This disconnect may have hampered a great many riff deliveries. I'll get more into this particular disconnect later on. Changing gears here, let's go through some of the host segments next. To start, it's somewhat notable that Space Mutiny has five total host segments, relative to Cry Wilderness's four. Space Mutiny's host segments are some of the best in classic MST3K. Well, most of them, anyway. Take, for example, the first bit with the old encyclopedias. The periodic table has three elements in it, Mike. There's a volume for the letter Epsilon. There's a mailing address for Machu Picchu. It's got a picture of Stonehenge. So? Under construction? Yeah. Oh, well, so what you high-minded encyclopedia snobs are trying to tell me is you want a new set. Fine, uh, I'll get you a new set. Anything that's not handwritten on papyrus will do. Yeah, that's, that's very true. funny. We'll be right back. The jokes are staccato, yet well-paced, and they work well to build a comedic tension. Also, here's a visual gag I never noticed until this project. Check out the big puff of dust emitted when Mike slaps an aged encyclopedia. Now that's quality in prop design. Finally, the payoff to the comedic tension arrives. I think I've more than answered your encyclopedia grievances. No. 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 It was much more fun to complain about the old ones than to have new ones. Yeah, yeah I miss complaining <laughs> already, frankly. <laughs> Sorry. 
The host segment continues with the overarching season plot, with Pearl, Bobo, and Brain Guy being imprisoned in ancient Rome. The Sci-Fi Channel run used serialized comedy in the host segments to great effect, really making full use of the comedic potential of the space. The hosts were not thrilled with this, but honestly, I think it kind of works. Anyway, the next bit in the host segment mines one of the greatest wellsprings of comedy in the Mike episodes of MST3K, Ripping on Mike. Bring Mike down! Oh, oh. Uh, Mike, everyone says you're ugly and dumb and no one likes you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, they do not. Really? Oh, man, that... Really? Oh, man, that really brought me down. It's just so on the nose. I love it so much. It's perfect. The bit also culminates in this. Then bring Mike down here. Yeah, okay, nice lady. <laughs> oh, oh, my. <laughs> what am I doing here? I was just at a 401k planning meeting. Oh, by the way, my name's Mike Down. I'm a CPA. This guy is perfectly cast. That might be because he's non-ironically been the show's financial controller for years. Now, regrettably, there really isn't this level of structured comedic buildup and release in the Cry Wilderness host segments, but the one thing you can say is they clearly spent money on the props, and you can really tell they put effort into them. Although this too, admittedly, is something of a departure from classic MST3K. It was a concerted effort, and it was so cheap. That's the thing, but I love the way it turned out. Many, many hundreds of pounds of hot glue over the course of our- Oh, Lord. Gaffer tape, hot glue, staples, yes. string, and drywall screws. Or that's yeah. what the entire thing was held together by. A stiff wind could have knocked any of those sets over. Either way, I definitely enjoyed the theremin turkey bits. Ah! Wow, that's kind of sobering. Oof. Yeah, really reminds you you're cutting into a once living thing. The interspersed jokes just aren't quite making it though. It's just one thing after another without much in the way of flow most of the time. Take for example the third host segment in Cry Wilderness. It's an encounter between the antagonists of the sci-fi run and the new antagonists. There are jokes, yes, but the jokes just kind of come from nowhere. Like when Bobo starts using some VR gloves to do remote social grooming on Max. Admittedly, maybe I'm just nitpicking the nitpicking. Overall, I get what they were going for in trying to connect the old seasons with the new, but as Kinga herself admits, And it's so much work seeming this season with the old one. I should have just rebooted. <laughs> seriously though, a reboot with entirely different robots might have gone down easier. Before I close out this section, I want to compare two host segments that share a similar focus, and again highlight why one works and one doesn't. Observe host segment two of Space Mutiny. It begins with a blissful quiet. There's genuinely no dialogue for quite a long time. And then wham, Crow and Tom are dogfighting outside the satellite of love. This is something of a reference to the space dogfighting earlier in the movie. This goes on for some time before it culminates with the solid punchline. Oh, I see. So yeah. don't you think we maybe should have used them for escape purposes? Huh? What, 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 what's he on about? Oh, you mean escape from here? Oh, jeez. Oh, How oh. stupid of us, Mike. Oh, man. Boy, is my face red. Oh, sorry, oh, Mike. Boy. This also has two excellent follow-ups in Gypsy crashing her ship too, and then the logo bumper itself shaking from the explosion. Let's compare this to the final host segment of Cry Wilderness. Crow and Tom, using some kind of elaborate cardboard getup, pretend to be a character from the movie, attempting to cajole the keys to Jonah's ship from Max. This is weird for a few reasons, the least of which that they really have to go with the cutout. This bit may have been improved if they had used a costume for Crow, with obviously fake animals all around him. I don't think the prop gave as much to this particular skit. The bit doesn't really make logical sense either, as Red Hawk wasn't exactly known for his persuasion abilities, but I'll give that a pass. Anyway, the bit goes on for a while with Max seemingly being on the verge of giving in, until Kinga conveniently walks in, dispelling what limited comedic tension there was. 
So the through line here is that both of these are escape bits, another rich source of comedy throughout the series. I'm not going to say categorically the Cry Wilderness bit couldn't have worked, but it does feel a little early in the new season to be playing with that, as it's only the second episode, and the stakes don't really feel like they've been established. You'll also note the difference in comedic resolution. The Space Mutiny bit is resolved by the comedic short-sightedness of the bots, whereas the Cry Wilderness bit is resolved seemingly by happenstance. If I'm being honest though, and it is my video so I may as well be, the big problem could be that I'm really just not feeling the writing of the host characters here. We need to talk about Jonah. He's too confident, too cool. A natural born gizmocrat. I heard that he works outside the system, but he's effective. Yes, but his independent streak could get him into trouble. <laughs> You're darn tootin'. He's written to be immediately capable and knowledgeable when the show needs a human foil to clown on. They even fast forward to two months after he was abducted for his first proper host segment. Mister, I've been here for two months! We're Enjoy. like dogs, we have no sense of time. <laughs> this leaves a truly absurd amount of comedic potential on the table. Think back to Mike's onboarding, how he was introduced in the last Joel episode as clueless and confused. Say, what is the deal with this guy and those cute robots? Listen, Mr. $4.25 an hour, you stick with the boxes and I'll handle the experiment. Is that all right with you? Then treated as a newbie making rookie mistakes in his first episode. Compared to today's experiment, the Beast of Yucca Flat was just a cakewalk. <laughs> I only hope I can do it. <laughs> ah, buck up, new meat. Thanks, Tom. That's crow. Right. The Netflix run's first episode, Reptilicus, might have been an excellent opportunity to, I don't know, re-establish the stakes of the premise with some Jonah fish-out-of-water scenes? While the intro sets up the show as well as ever, I think there's something to be said for diegetically spelling things out, particularly as that can lead to a lot of great jokes. Instead, they take time in this first critical host segment to explain that Gypsy has a new voice and hangs from the ceiling. You know, Gypsy was taking all this floor space up with her coils and I kept on tripping on them. Uh, oh yeah. yeah, major fire hazard. We loved it. And we've got all this unused fly space above us and I figured why not rig her up there? Come on down, Gyps. Hi, everybody. Hey. I upgraded her language center. I wanted to give her a Midwest accent. You know, those women have music in their voices. Okay, cool kind of feels like a misplaced and unnecessary reassurance for the long-term fans when so much else has changed already. This was a weird tendril to lead with, and perhaps it would have been better for the show to worry more about appealing to a fresh audience. But I digress, I'm supposed to be talking about Jonah here. So Jonah doesn't seem to be written with any flaws, but is he written with any particular traits that lend themselves to comedy? Joel was soft-spoken and even-tempered. Mike had the inherently funny quality of being from Wisconsin. Jonah? Well, he's pretty good at singing. But beyond that, I'm not really getting coherent character vibes from him. More of a vehicle for the other writers to deliver jokes. He's described in the Making Of documentary as... I'm the irritating kid from next door uh, that wants to hang out with Crow and Servo. And he's just so constantly pleased to be here, too. I don't need to know how he eats and breathes and other science facts, but I do need to at least believe he's an actual person in his universe. For lack of a better term, he's kind of a space trucker. The man's gonna stand up. All that gets blended together, you really start to get a feel of who this character is. He had a job, he had a life, he worked for Gizmonic and he's plucked away from it. I'm sorry, but I'm really not seeing it. His occupation before being kidnapped has absolutely no bearing on him that I can recall. I don't even believe it's mentioned outside of the opening. Perhaps this characterization was left on the cutting room floor? On that note, these issues go double for the bots. He's very arrogant, uh, charming. Roguish, if you will. Totally dashing. Wannabe dashing. He, he fancies himself a playboy. So, like, he's a, a, a smarmy, cocksure... Completely sexy. In, like, a bad boy sort of way, where, like, he's gonna ride the line. Stoic? Oh... 
Yes. <laughs> um. Let's see here. Um. Normal, I guess. Just kind of normal. <laughs> I can't answer that. You know it. I don't remember that character. Okay. In terms of traits demonstrated in Cry Wilderness, Crow has something of a penchant for random acts of violence now? Note to self, cattle prod. And Tom makes really off the wall, instantly dated pop culture references? Yeah, I understand now. So why'd they make the Entourage movie? It hurts to say it, but none of the main hosts have developed personalities. And as a result, they don't have any chemistry as a comedic team. I don't know, sort of flat and lifeless. Uh, they're cardboard cutouts. Exactly, like they're cardboard cutouts. Looking back at classic MST3K, it's clear now just how important that chemistry was. There was a great deal of interplay between the hosts. You know, how come all movies end in a cave? Well, To Kill a Mockingbird didn't. Oh, well, you're right about that. At Long Last Love didn't. Oh, that's true. Have and Have Not, Anna Christie. Mm -hmm. You're right, just about all of them, none of them ended in a cave. But this place is filled with breadsticks. Admittedly, I don't have an encyclopedic memory of all the riffs of seasons 11 and 12, but I can't think of any exchanges that reached this level. I realized that in these Netflix seasons, they were fresh as all get out, and this kind of synergy takes time to build, but I feel like we should at least be seeing some attempts. I also can't help but wonder just how much the Midwestern nature of classic MST3K was important to its success. Mike certainly credits part of the show's success to it. I think staying in the Midwest was crucial to the fact that the show yeah, did so absolutely well. essential. Yeah, there's just no way we could, I mean, the, the, the point of view is so Midwestern and so, uh, you know, it, it, it had to be. Being from the Southwest, I always thought of the Midwest as a strange, mythical place with entertaining people. MSD3K was a big part of that. I know the new Coastal hosts don't intend to be exclusionary, but I can't help but feel a part of the vibe may be off as a result of this regional shift. Maybe I'm being too mean here. Maybe the Netflix run just wasn't long enough to establish much in the way of new personalities. Although, I will say Kinga and Max were playing their types very well from the jump. But with all the credited writers who worked on this, surely somebody could have worked out personalities for the hosts. Especially as the hosts themselves are also credited writers. On that note, let's talk about the writers and writing process. Watching the Season 11 Making Of documentary, We Brought Back MST3K, is extremely bittersweet. You can tell there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for the project, and just about everyone seems to be a longtime fan. But there are some rather telling moments that I think say a lot about how Netflix MST3K turned out the way it did. If I had a lick of sense, I would have started this project with this documentary. For example, this. So the energy here is frenetic, and the pace is really rapid, we were able to do it at a much more relaxed pace. Um, so it's amazing the stamina that these guys have. And it's just like constantly on and so you know we were doing two movies a day and it took you know, you know 12, 13 hours a day. This sounds bad. Like really bad. I guess what I got to over time was just to say listen I don't want you to worry. This is a document. This is us trying our hardest. This is us putting everything together. And the day we shoot is the document of that, and that's the story. Given the sheer number of moving parts required to make the Netflix seasons, a breakneck pace does not sound kind to the writing process. I found in my, in my experience, uh, riffing professionally, we, we get less time than this. So oh, really? This is, a, this is luxurious, yeah. Well, they called it a, the gauntlet for a reason. Yeah, oh, yeah. did they ever. Yeah. Maybe the KTMA days could turn out episodes rapidly, but this was a totally different scale of production. This rapid pace is also in stark contrast to the leisurely vibe of the later seasons of classic MST3K. And then we would rehearse. Um, Which got to be longer, the rehearsal process got to be longer and longer as the show went on, because we realized if we just really keep working on this, it's so much better. Because there was a point where you just can't see Joe Don Baker's face anymore, and you just don't want to, I don't want to work on that joke because it's the one where he's the big sweaty mug, and so you kind of give up. 
and and uh, and we finally learned if you just muscle through it and really give that a lot of time, it'll be that much better. I used to sometimes think that the schedule was rigorous, and I my, my my wife Bridget, who also worked on the show, when she was at home, she used to tease me because I'd call from the set, and it would be like 5:30, and say, "Well, this seems like it's going to go a long time," and then I'd show up at the door at like 6:15. You know, <laughs> you are such a whiner. You work in TV, and it's like the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. So uh, it felt sometimes it felt rigorous, but then you realize this is like a dream job, and we never. That we always wanted to keep our lives in, uh, intact outside of the show, so it was pretty easy. It was always important for us to have a life beyond the TV show and not have to sit in a bungalow in, you know, in Hollywood on a studio lot, day in and day out, going from writing to producing and then back to writing and doing that cycle. We give ourselves ample vacation time. Uh, we do six shows or six weeks of work and then have a week off. Uh, it, it was actually nice. it's, it's wonderful and. At first, of course, when we were first gearing up the show and figuring out what it was, we spent a whole lot more time doing it. And that was when we were having 12 and 14 hour days and six day weeks. Uh, but we got rid of that crap as quickly as we could. I think things are going well. It's, we're going so fast that it's, it's hard to, you don't want to take too long. You want to be as good as you can. I'm going to take a wild guess and say this time limitation was imposed by Netflix to get the seasons out the door. It could also very well be the biggest reason for the weaknesses of those seasons. One data point I want to highlight here is just how many more writers worked on the Netflix seasons. On Space Mutiny, there are six credited writers, with Mike Nelson in the head writer position. Notably, all the main hosts are on here, as is Pearl. It also admittedly likely helped that most of the credited writers have been writing riffs for nearly a decade at this point. On the Cry Wilderness side, there are 17 credited writers. 17. Too many cooks, too many cooks. Now, I'm sure there are ways a production with 17 credited writers can work, but I have to say, at face value, some concerns immediately come to mind. First and foremost is the issue of voice. I don't think it's a stretch to assume that of the six writers on Space Mutiny, the three main hosts wrote or at least had significant say in the writing of their own characters, taking the lines they felt most comfortable with in the line assign process. Meanwhile, on Cry Wilderness, with the sheer number of writers, including celebrity guest writers, I think something was lost here. We had a number of guest writers whose names you might recognize who were also contributing riffs and jokes for the segments. We had Bobby Lopez who wrote the songs for Frozen among many other things. We had Dan Harmon of Community. We had Joel McHale also of Community. Well, he just said, would you write, write an episode? And I said, yes, of course, I will ruin your television show. Yes, I'll put my name anywhere near this show. It is very surreal to be doing this show that I loved so much. The writing process they describe sounds like one heck of a group project, collaborating remotely on a single document. We had this very interesting system that involved remote write, a combination of remote writing from writers uh, sending in riffs and guest writers uh, doing commentary and riffs on episodes and using a piece of software that we had to all work together on the same film file. It does beg the question to what level were the riffs reviewed and talked through as a team. It may have been beneficial to remove more riffs in the review process. That's the first time that many people have ever been in a single canoe. Usually it's two 11-year-old girls at camp. I can't help but wonder what, if anything, didn't make the cut. That aside, I think this overall writing structure led to a kind of hollowing of the hosts to a certain degree making them merely the voice actors voicing the riffs. I think there's a pretty big difference in coming up with and telling a joke versus reading somebody else's jokes. Perhaps the fact that the hosts didn't write most of their jokes themselves is why they seemed so often to try to zazz up the jokes with their deliveries to very mixed results. Oh, for fun. Somehow I never get tired of going on Splash Mountain. I can't wait to see our photo. <laughs> Numerically, the average number of credited writers on season 11 is 15.4. This drops to 10 for season 12. 
Now obviously writer count isn't the whole story here, and I'm not anything even remotely resembling a professional writer, so these are just my speculations. But these numbers seem high, especially for a comedy form that typically requires the host to put so much of themselves into their performances. In our modern Twitch, YouTube commentary era, this is even more stark. People aren't generally watching that stuff for the structure of the commentary, it is the personalities that keep people coming back. Anyway, complications with the writing process aside, I do want to highlight one of the writers in particular. Did you ever hear the tragedy of Elliot Kalin, the writer? A very talented writer, he presided over many quality years of writing for The Daily Show. More importantly, in the context of writing for MST3K, he's a core part of the Flophouse Podcast, a podcast covering bad movies since the year of our Lord 2008. The Flophouse and We Hate Movies arguably occupying the top two spots in the bad movie podcast space. He secured his dream job of working on MST3K, and was even the lead writer of the season 12 episodes. I want to be clear here, I'm not blaming Elliot for the fate of either of the Netflix seasons. Elliot seems to get it. With Mystery Science Theater, we want to almost take a movie that is not good, to put it mildly, and through this almost like, it's almost like alchemy, like the riffing is the Philosopher's Stone that turns it into gold or something enjoyable. And you have to find the right riffs and the right tone and the right style to almost like lead the movie through a transformation process until it becomes enjoyable to watch. And of course he does. He's been delivering riffs about movies in an asynchronous manner for over a decade now, and he sells a bit like no other. Ellie, you had an idea for a Ziggy movie. I just feel like the Ziggy character is one that has a lot of cinematic potential. What is he? Man or unmanned Superman? <laughs> Subhuman? You don't know. Then there's the dynamic between him and the parrot. The parrot hates him, but depends on him. And it's that dependency, I think, that makes him hate him. It's a very Grey Gardens aspect. You've got the dog. The dog is loyal. Dogs representing loyalty as dogs. Uh, and then you've got, say, his different complaints, his different troubles of the world, obstacles. Goes to the complaint department. That could be a big set. That's your set piece right there. What does the complaint department look like on the other side of the complaint window. Uh, you've got, he goes to the doctor's office, maybe he has cancer, I don't know. That could be your story, very Constantine. He ha he runs out of man dresses, doesn't wear pants, does he get in trouble for that? Does he have genitalia? We don't know, because the man dress covers it, but he doesn't wear pants. He has a cat. The cat is indifferent, we don't know. Aliens land, very often in the script. Is the movie about the first time he makes contact? He just goes, tremendously skilled at improvisation. In the context of this analysis, I'm sure he left a big impact on Cry Wilderness, and Cry Wilderness seems to have left an impact on him, too. But Pinocchio should wait here. Pinocchio immediately disobeys that, uh, disobeys his horse fa father to go fa <laughs> Very realistic Bella. boy behavior. Very yeah. reali reas realistic boy his age behavior to immediately run off when his horse father tells him, stay right here. So what's the tragedy I'm talking about in all this? Well, frankly, I think he should have been one of the hosts. Listen to the episodes of the Flophouse podcast and tell me he wouldn't have been a great crow, or even some hypothetical New Yorker robot. This may have been preferable to other people reading out his riffs, and it could have given the show some much needed voice. Anyhow, let's move on. I want to briefly touch on the political angle of MST3K. Netflix MST3K is extremely subdued with its politics. This is likely due to some kind of decree from Netflix to keep the show as marketable as possible. I'm not necessarily saying that's a good nor bad thing for the quality of the humor, but it is notable. By contrast, the new Gizmoplex season has a few jokes here and there punching up at billionaires and making a few concrete economic riffs. Do you know what exactly we're looking for? Anything strange, I guess. It's strange like a pig doing the mashed potato? Or how 25% of your bones are located in your feet. Or strange like how some people think it's possible to live off a minimum wage, am I right? Yeah, right. Fairly standard stuff these days, but it is good to see some clear pro-working class messages. Notably, they don't have many politician-based jokes, which has played out and stale as those jokes have become, maybe for the best, honestly. It's kind of weird, though, that the show's official Twitter account quote-tweeted somebody who wrote the following. 
Overall, the crew is against imperialism, jingoism, church state as one, fascism, exploitation, racism, in short, all those ideals held dear by our leaders here on Earth. Oh wait, excuse me, that wasn't a tweet at all. It was a letter read on air by Joel in 1991. Taking into account that overall the crew is against imperialism, jingoism, church state as one, fascism, exploitation, racism, in short, all those ideals held dear by our world leaders here on Earth, I'd venture to say this time portal showed mankind living in peace. It's quite striking how unabashedly political classic MST3K was at times, in the early seasons especially. That was never the point of the show, of course. But in some cases, classic MST3K was pretty far ahead of the discourse. I can no longer sit idly by on my little robot haunches and watch Caucasian actors being continually cast in non-Caucasian roles. Tonight's episode, drop personal pronouns or die. It's not particularly difficult to see why Chapo Trap House cited MST3K as an inspiration. Which early 60s CIA covert operation was considered their greatest failure of the decade? So, Los Alamos. Uh, the Kennedy assassination. No, I'm afraid that one was a success. Even with the chance for political gags to fall flat, I'd be lying if I said I didn't want this kind of gag to come back. Especially now that MST3K is presumably immune from corporate overlord meddling. Comedy can be liberating particularly in pointing out the absurd contradictions of the institutions and hierarchies that dominate our existence. And it's pretty impressive how well classic MST3K pulled this off, mostly. These were not merely half-baked jokes about various politicians, but jokes that really spoke to an experience, perhaps a genuine disappointment with the way things ultimately turned out for everyone. This is a dream, a two-parent house. Jokes that make you oof, right? Maybe I'm reading too much into it. These moments were admittedly fairly few and far between, but they did give the show even more heart. To me, anyway. A minor thing, but on that note, it's pretty lame how the Mystery Science Theater and Rift Track's official Twitch channels both have explicit no-politics rules. Having a no-politics rule is a pretty big cop-out when so much of politics is excellent fodder for jokes. A blanket ban is disappointingly favorable to those who prefer the terrible status quo. Obviously, a more nuanced ban on certain topics would be much more difficult to enforce, so on a structural level, I get it, but still, lame. For example, in this scene in Final Justice, Jodon Baker is literally in a cab, and the people need to know, goddammit. While this video has predominantly been about Netflix-era MST3K in comparison to classical MST3K, I'd be remiss if I didn't more fully discuss Lucky Season 13, the beginning of the self-published Gizmoplex era. And you know what? I actually like it. I think it's the strongest revival season yet. You can even see the seeds of the Gizmoplex being sown in the Season 11 documentary. And we've already heard from hundreds of backers who have said, you know, if Netflix doesn't offer you the best deal in the world, forget them. Like, bring it back to us and we'll do another season. There you have it! Mystery Science Theater is back! You can really tell they've made some good progress in addressing some of the concerns people likely brought up with the Netflix era. For one thing, the rifts seem far better spaced out, with more room to breathe. This also likely had the secondary effect of causing them to cut a lot of the less funny filler riffs that may have otherwise cluttered the scripts. Of course, there are still some jokes I don't think should have made the cuts. Hey, S.A., don't you know I'm loco? <laughs> but such is inevitable. There are still a lot of writers, though nowhere near the peak of season 11. Even the shorts have quite a few. I still think this may be causing some issues with delivery, but for whatever reason, it feels less stilted than in the Netflix seasons. They may have returned more creative control to the hosts themselves, or allowed them more time to rehearse. I'd also like to put forward that I think the host segments feel more in line with the spirit of the original now, too. Take, for example, this host segment from the first episode of season 13. How were you so cool and well-liked in high school? Well, you know, what can I say? Some guys, they just got it. Wait a minute. 
Jonah, you didn't grow up in Trenton. <laughs> <laughs> I made it up! I made it up! I'm a fraud! It's not even my yearbook! I stole this from some dude at a bus stop! <laughs> ah, it's good to have this dynamic restored. It's hard to put my finger on exactly why this feels so necessary to the format, but I'm glad to see it back. Maybe the previous Netflix seasons felt too hugboxy, without much direct interpersonal conflict? There's also the introduction of a new set of hosts, with new voices for Crow and Servo. While I kinda wish they had gone with new robots for the new voices, I get it. It saves a significant amount of money and time. You go to theater with the bots you have, not the bots you want, I guess. I think the new human host, Emily, is delightful for the most part. I think she does indeed have range, and delivers some pretty good tri-state area-based accents and humor. However, she seems to be leaning a bit too much into the wacky voices and noises brand of comedy. Hey, we'll be coming round the seashore when we come, when we come. We'll be capturing back women when we come, when we come. We'll be, yeah, come on guys, join in, it's fun. If we're not having fun, why are we here? Forget it. Please, Emily, please tone this down. Not just for me or other fans, but for yourself. You don't need wacky voices to be funny. That goes double for you, Emily's Crow. The Gizmoplex! If anyone involved with the Gizmoplex run is watching this, and you take nothing else in this video to heart, please, please at least stop the over-the-top kooky voices. Even still, I think this Gizmoplex experiment has largely been comedically successful, and proves that quality modern MST3K is possible. In a way, MST3K has come full circle back to the smaller budgets of the KTMA era, yet also makes the most of the modern media environment, self-publishing as a web show. Joel himself called season 13 smaller and scrappier. I think that's to the show's benefits. Kinga's actress, Felicia Day, was quoted as saying, There was not a Netflix to approve the script, so we could change stuff on the fly if it didn't work and it was a lot more collaborative. And really, it has the spirit of the original show a lot more than the last two seasons. And I think she's dead right in her assessments. I do want to highlight one particular episode of season 13 that proved to me beyond a shadow of a doubt that the foundation of modern MST3K was now secure. The fourth episode of the new season, Munchie. If you haven't seen it yet, please pause the video, spend the five bucks or whatever to rent it, and continue this video after watching it. I'm serious, it's that good. Okay, watched it now? Cool. So as you may have noticed, this episode hit different in a very good way. For one thing, the core conflict of the show has been gloriously restored, and oh what a sight. Jonah's entirely believable reaction to the first appearance of the eponymous Munchie, and subsequent refusal to re-enter the theater, leading to Kinga cutting off his air supply, was Chef's Kiss perfect. Oh, oh God! What is that? Oh my what God! Is that? Oh my God! No. What are you dorks doing? Get back in the theater! No. <sighs> The re-establishing of the comedic conflict of the premise probably should have come back in the earlier Netflix seasons, but oh lord is it good to see again. The stakes are back, baby. I'll also say there is a wide variety of quality riffs in this one, so it's not even just that one moment that elevates it. Felicia Day was quoted as saying that working on the Munchie episode hurt her soul, and I would entirely believe that but it does appear to have been worth it. This episode is a real model for the future. More of this, please. And more of this is definitely possible, especially as against all odds, there is a sequel to Munchie. Before I close out with the conclusion of this video, I wanted to convey a few things that didn't really fit anywhere else in the script, but I still thought deserved mention. 
While I didn't go through all the various joke categories I used in my analysis, as such would have largely been a waste of time, I did want to highlight one type of joke that makes up almost half of each episode. Likely a solid chunk of all MST3K episodes. Reframe or recontextualization jokes. These jokes create worlds, often in the mimicked voices of the characters themselves. These jokes add new layers to the story, often veering violently away from its intended meaning. Ah, who took my purse? <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> it is not hard to see why these jokes are so compelling. It is not dissimilar from the sentence mixing of the YTP movement. Years ago we were hearing stories about how people lived to the ripe old age of 17 by eating nothing. The reason is that food is bad. Bad is not good. Here are some ways to fight food first. Avoid foods, particularly if it's plain yogurt. Or edits of certain game cutscenes. Are you familiar with Big Chungus? Big Chungus? It is the taking of the raw material of a work and spinning it into something new and unexpected. There is an undeniable joy in witnessing the breaking and subverting of these intended meanings, not merely as some kind of an exercise in media vandalism, but in creating a new work of art entirely. In the context of MST3K, this works especially well when the subversion fits just right, and you could genuinely believe it in the moment, less so when it's entirely ungrounded. The better the use a given recontextualization joke makes of the raw material of the movie, the greater its resonance and hilarity. I would go so far as to say these kinds of jokes make the MST3K movie segments. That's definitely not to say that there's no place for observational humor from the outside context, of course. Even reference-based humor has its place, if it fits. Being able to address the material successfully from a wide variety of different comedic angles seems to be a big part of the success of an episode, in my estimation. Alright, a few quick things now before the conclusion. Bill Corbett, voice actor for Crow in the later classic seasons and extremely high quality Twitter follow, is the deer parasite in Infinity Train. Hey, what's in your mouth? Hello, hi, nice to meet you. Hop to board your deer pal back in the mud. Out of the mouth, parasite! Now! Hey, whoa, <gasps> what's with the name calling? And Joel is Mayor Dewey in Steven Universe. It's great, but I may need more. My gosh, I've never had an opponent before. Even when I ran for mayor of high school, I ran unopposed. Probably because I made up the position. There's a lot of amazing references to MST3K in various forms of media, but one of my favorites has to be this pixel art husk of Tom in the very excellent Wadget Eye adventure game, Primordia. Quite an interesting game, taking place in a distant future where robots have inherited the Earth, some of them revering the departed humanity as godlike creators. It's very well written. If you're into point and click adventure games, definitely check it out. How great is it that there's a Roku streaming channel for MST3K? A Pluto TV channel too, apparently. It's great background noise when doing laundry or taking a leisurely afternoon nap. It was also a great way to research a wide variety of different episodes for this video, so thank you for that, Shout Factory or whoever made it possible. It's worth mentioning that the Rift Tracks for Roller Gator is currently free on YouTube. It's definitely a must-see part of Rift Tracks' body of work. Roller Gator also features the venerable actor Joe Estevez, who features in numerous classic MST3K episodes as well as Tim Heidecker's On Cinema universe. Apparently his older brother is some kind of obscure actor, though I've not seen much of his stuff. I think he was the bad guy in Mass Effect 3. Eh well, maybe he'll break into the big times one day. All in all, while Netflix MST3K didn't work for a variety of reasons, it proved useful as a transitional form for it to reach its current iteration. But in the relative weakness of these Netflix seasons, we can see the importance of giving creators the time and flexibility to create. In my estimation, it also highlights the importance of voice in the writing, both in how easily it can be lost, and how much better it is when the writer and performer are one. We live in an era overflowing with commentary media, 
much of it tracing its origin all the way back to a sleepy TV studio in Minnesota. This video itself is commentary media. If somebody made a reaction video to it, that would be another layer. And on and on. This modern hall of mirrors with endless personalities to choose from is a stark contrast from the media landscapes of old. But it is precisely this media landscape that modern MST3K finds itself competing with. Conceptually sound jokes are just not enough. The genuine heart, the character, the delivery, all things that the Netflix seasons lacked have a chance to come back now. Indeed, the seeds have already been sown and are starting to bear fruit, Munchie being the standout example. I believe that MST3K is on the right path again and will continue to flower if it can connect with new generations of people in a genuine and unforced way. I hope it has the opportunity, for while so many people I personally knew grew up loving MST3K, I haven't heard hide nor hair of anyone speaking about the new seasons, neither Netflix nor Gizmoplex. Anecdotal, I know, but it does give me pause. Being on its own site now, it may be even more difficult to shepherd people to it, but I suppose word of mouth will once again have to suffice. For what it's worth, I do think season 13 is worth your time. Though you may want to rent a few more episodes before pulling the trigger on the whole season for its somewhat eye-watering price. I do take solace, though, that more of it is likely going to the creators themselves, and I hope it goes towards making future seasons. A far better deal than Star Citizen, that's for sure. And I honestly can't wait to see future seasons. The bad movie possibilities are wide open. Will they secure the rights to Neil Brain's fateful findings? Maybe they'll turn over a rock and somehow obtain the rights to After Last Season. Whatever movies they pick, I hope they're able to keep going. As they get into the swing of things and refine their comedic voices, I have great hopes. And if you find the Gizmoplex to your liking, I hope you'll come along for the ride too. Us Misties all.